Uh, the other the other guy would throw it all my food to the audience. I guess that's the. Oh man, that's, where that's where was where was social media and the cameras back then? That'd be I would. Yeah, that was that though. was decades ago. I much younger man then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good things to think about, right? Yeah. Uh, well, let's dive in. We got some good topics to hit on today. Yeah, yeah. As we do uh, most weeks, we look at headlines and see kind of what's what's hitting, what's important to investors. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, the FOMC meeting. Uh, led by Jerome Powell, Federal Reserve, we saw what co comments about interest rates. Markets thought that we yeah. might see interest rates drop in uh, May, uh, March. March, yeah. Right. Uh, however, now a new tale. Yeah, yeah. Effectively, what happened after the announcement this week, the Federal Reserve um, stocks got more volatile. Stocks sold off on Wednesday. Um, Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal head of the Federal Reserve, basically said we don't need to cut rates as soon as um, the market is effectively expecting, which is March. The, the market was expecting a March rate cut, and they're basically saying now, not really needed. We're not expecting to do that in March. Yeah, so their mandate is to uh, what, jobs, inflation, those are the two parts. So they're looking at those numbers and saying, we're just fine to keep maintaining this interest rate that we've currently get, currently got. Yeah, exactly. Their main lever is around interest rates, the short-term interest rate environment, raising it and lowering it to either kind of slow down growth or speed it up. And so they're basically saying, we're staying steady. That was expected that they're not going to change at this meeting, but it's well, what the difference or the change was from December was that the tone is more of we don't need to do it as soon as what was previously expected. And the markets, of course, operate off expectations, and those expectations just changed. Yeah. I'm reminded of an episode we did a, you know, maybe a year ago, the pen is mightier than the sword, Yeah, that kind of the thematic of it, that if Powell and central bankers are just sort of indicating or inkling, hinting, uh, that that may be enough to let the markets know, uh, ease off, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. And financial markets reacted. We saw that in a moment. So you think about, yeah, the pen is mightier than the sword. And, you know, the 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 weight that the Federal Reserve carries is quite a bit, right? The markets moved based on those comments and the expectations changed. It's We, we still think in the, in the Federal Reserve uh, say, saying, effectively telegraphing the same thing is that, they're going to cut rates sometime this year. It's just going to be later than what was previously expected. So it's not a matter of, are they going to do it? It's a matter of, when are they going to do it? Yeah, I think about the sell-off that happened on Wednesday, You know, but that before that, what preceded <laughs> it is uh, the Dow Jones, S&P indexes hitting you know, either highs or mm -hmm. all-time highs, uh, certainly doing well. So it's, it's not like markets are down. They're just down from highs, which is probably pretty healthy in some ways. Yeah, yeah. Some of the headlines yesterday, of course, they kind of get... Um, you know, of course, they try to be grabbing eyeballs, but, you know, it was more a bigger move in the market than we've seen in a few months. But we've also been through in the fourth quarter of last year and into the first part of this year, we saw stock markets rise quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not all that unusual or uncommon or unexpected to see some volatility. And this week, it was really kicked off by those comments on, on when they're going to when they're going to cut rates. Yeah, think about what uh, what would cause them to lower rates. We said inflation and jobs numbers doing pretty well. What's the big mm -hmm. elephant in the room? Yeah. So yeah, inflation is a big part of it. That's been the story in the last several quarters, right? Inflation moved a lot higher um, quarters ago, even going back a couple of years. And so the lever for them was to raise interest rates to kind of slow things down to get inflation to come down. Now, that whole time, the other mandate they have is the jobs market has stayed pretty robust and it continues to be. Um, there hasn't been a lot of change there. So they've been able to be pretty... Um, aggressive with rate hikes to stomp out inflation and not trigger um, any kind of kind of um, sidesteps or mishaps in the jobs market. So they've so far, they've been you know, relatively successful with their moves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, moving into the the debt. So financially, uh, the US has, is carrying debt. That's kind of structurally um, one of the ways we, we operate here in the US is that we, we carry a debt. And I believe it's what is third? 34 trillion. I 34 is, trillion. That's with a T. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's the amount of debt. There's interest on that. Yeah. That's come and due. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, treasuries being a way that they were financing this debt. And every couple of weeks, is it they have a treasury sale? Yeah. Various two-year, ten-year, thirty-year, something like that. Yeah. And yeah, 
where, where am I going with this? It's uh, that we're trying to finance the debt and the, that debt is at 30% is coming due in 2024. Yeah, yeah, there's a high percent of the 34 trillion that will be coming due that will be maturing in 2024. And of course, that will need to get re effectively kind of refinanced um, into new bonds at current interest rate environments. Right, because we're not we're not paying off the debt, we're just refinancing the debt at a different rate. Yeah, exactly. Um, we don't have the dollars to pay off pay off the debt. It's only um, 34 trillion after yeah, all. Yeah. And as a side note, we have a we have a um, a budget deficit too. So not only do we have the 34 trillion, we're going to be adding to that. So as a bond comes due, think of it as a as a as a treasury bond matures, um, they're refinancing that into a new one, and they are also adding to the pile because there's other spending commitments that were put in place that are getting added to it. And so it's also increasing more. And maybe from a consumer perspective, if I have a credit card, I run that one up. Um, I kind of hit my limit. I go out and get a new credit card. Yeah. It has a different rate, but allows me a, a greater limit, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, yeah, to use that example, the, the limit, the credit card limit has, uh, keeps on rising. Right. And so we've been able to kind of keep borrowing more. Uh, but there's a cost to that. And, and an interest rate uh, yeah. consequence or reality? Yeah, probably a little both. both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yes, both. <laughs> um, yeah, and going back to the Federal Reserve and how, so the Treasury's, you know, Treasury and Federal Reserve, two different um, kind of uh, parts of the government. Tying that back together, as the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve has increased interest rates, it's made that cost of borrowing get higher and higher, larger and larger. In fact, if we looked at a 10-year Treasury bond that was issued three years ago, it was uh, about a 1.1% interest rate, meaning every year it'd be 1.1% of that outstanding amount is the interest cost. It gets paid for 10 years, and at the end of the 10 years, it gets refinanced into a new bond. That's pretty cheap uh, money, all in all. It's really cheap, yeah. very cheap. Um, and fast forward to today, so three years later, it's a little over 4%, call it 4%. And so we went from about a 1% borrowing cost to 4%. In terms of what that means in terms of interest cost, not paying off the principal, the interest cost, it's about three times higher um, to go from those two rates. So it's three times more expensive to issue 10-year bonds now than it was three years ago. That's huge. Yeah. Right. It, when I look at the, uh, the sort of government balance sheet, uh, the, you know, the budget, if you will, what they expect to to pay off, you know, we have these line items like Medicare, Social Security, Defense, yeah. all these other ones. Um, what, so last year in 2023, they, they were projecting 600, uh, what was that? 640 billion was right. the interest cost um, for, um, to cover that debt. And so with new interest rates being what they are, we have a new projection. Right? Yeah, the new one cl closer to a trillion dollars. So that's the result of debt increasing Right, we're adding to the debt pile, as well as interest rates going higher. Now, why that's important now is that this year, again, 30% of that roughly 30, $34 trillion needs to get refinanced. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to what we started with, interest rates are higher. And so 30% of our 30, 30 or 34 trillion gets refinanced at a higher rate. And that gets to be an impact that's not really linear in terms of how much more it costs. It kind of gets to be more exponential in some ways. Right. Um, the real extreme example is a two-year treasury. So we talked about a 10-year treasury. Three years ago, the two-year treasury was at 0.14%. Free, just about. Basically free money. Almost zero. The treasury could issue bonds, and it would cost them basically nothing um, to, to borrow. And now that's at a little over 4%, 4.3%. So you go from basically close to zero to 4.3. That's about a 30-time increase in the interest cost, 30 Three, times. 300%. Yeah, right? 30 times higher. So what you were costing before to carry that bond is now 30 times higher. Yeah, from a, just a household perspective, if we were to live this way, yeah. uh, you know, to try to refinance, it would be just so significant. So it, would, it would be like having, um, <laughs> yeah, your interest payments would out, outweigh your, your principal for years and years and years. Yeah, and, you know, think of it too, that credit card example as a, at the consumer level, right, if the credit card company keeps raising your credit limit mm -hmm. and you're able to kind of keep um, borrowing more and more, that's right, the numbers still work out as long as the credit card company is willing to increase the limit. 
Uh, at some point, though, they may evaluate and say, look, this, this level is too high. We're not willing to raise it anymore. you got to start paying down the balance. Yeah. And we could, we could see that at some point. The U.S. economy is still the strongest economy in the world. It's not like we're concerned around treasuries and the treasury going bankrupt. It's still an extremely – our GDP and our economy is the strongest, and our treasuries are the safest in the world still. Yeah. Um, but we – you know, across all financial assets, we need to be – uh, aware that other participants, other investors across the globe, whether it's um, other countries that are buying our debt, um, whether it's institutions, whatever it might be, governments, cities, um, that that appetite, their willingness to kind of keep increasing the limit might change such that we have to um, find a way to borrow, borrow less or kind of pull down on that amount of debt. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it comes back to that interest rate, right? So if we can uh, lower, if, if the Fed lowers the interest rate, that money is made cheaper. It's easier to service that debt going forward. Uh, that Those who buy the treasuries are then getting less money back. Looks like that moves us into equities or other you know, real estate commodities, um, different things that have a fixed value, right? Those become, would seem to become more attractive. Yeah, they can. Yeah, yes. Um, interest rates impact, especially you think about the U.S. Treasury market, Treasury interest rates. Virtually, I should say virtually, most other, all other assets are priced off of treasuries, right? The risk-free rate is what's known as. Mm-hmm. And so whether it's a different type of corporate bond, a municipal bond, a stock, um, other types of assets, real estate, uh, commodities, generally it's priced relative to interest rates. So a movement in interest rates impacts other assets is the main takeaway there. Mm-hmm. A lot of it comes back to that. And for investors, as we think about how do we want to navigate this type of environment, for bond investors, if interest rates are higher, the, bond, the interest rate they can earn as the investor in that can be higher. That can be good news. Um, as interest rates come down, bond prices can go up. There's an inverse relationship there. So for bond investors, we're seeing that you know, bond, well, there's corporates, even treasuries in the short term, municipal bonds, right? There's been a um, more attractive bond market than we've seen in a long time. Right. Yeah. And that, like you say, it moves into bank CDs, you know, so you know, right now people are looking at, you know, holding short term money maybe in those and getting up a, a higher rate mm-hmm. you know, at their bank. Yeah. Yeah. And the other side too is, um, so bonds, the other broad asset class, think about stocks. Uh, stocks in a... Um, declining rate environment, if that's the path that we're on, which we believe we are, and the Fed has reiterated, stocks can perform just fine and do well in a uh, falling interest rate environment, right? The Federal Reserve, they have their main lever is to increase or reduce interest rates to either drive more growth or kind of slow things down if it's inflation. Um, and in an environment where they're trying to spur economic, economic activity, historically, they've succeeded in that, and that's pushed um, it, it's pushed economic activity higher, and it's pushed um, stock prices higher as well, broadly. Yeah, I think about that kind of forward-looking market view that, that eventually rates will come down, equities will go up. Uh, as we said, there was that sell-off um, kind of anticipating, but mm-hmm. maybe not here uh, getting that. Fed cut in March. That said, long-term thinking, it's just a matter of when. Yeah, as far as rate cuts? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a matter of when. It's not an if it's going to happen. It's a when is it going to happen. Yeah, just that, that kind of pressure on there to be able to service the debt at large. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any kind of takeaways or you know, for the uh, the investor here, probably invested a bit in both equities, bonds, maybe commodities, other things, real estate even? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one of the things you had mentioned before in terms of seeing alerts on your phone, right? Price alerts going off, seeing the Dow Jones or the S and P 500. These are broad market indices that have a basket of stocks underneath them, hitting all time highs. And that was the case late last year into this year. So a lot of times people ask the question: Is you know we're at all time highs? What does that mean going forward? Does that mean the stock market's going to collapse because we're at all time highs? And it's really just not that not the case. When we look back at the data going back. Um, over time, when markets hit all-time highs, we think the S&P 500, right, momentum tends to be a pretty strong force in the market. It's not always a predictor of it, but historically what has happened when markets hit all-time highs, when we evaluate the three and five years after that, there's really no difference whether you're starting at an all-time high or at any other period. And that's because kind of the normalization of market returns over time is a big part of that. 
And so that's why we think about investing. If we're going to invest in things like stocks that can be more volatile in the short term, this could be a year last year, we had volatility in the first part. It's important to make sure we get our time horizons aligned appropriately with the, t the time period that we're owning those investments for. Yeah, it just seems like we always get back to that, uh, trying to have something in the short term for people who are you know, uh, in retirement, kind of mm -hmm. living off of their portfolios, make sure that you can uh, handle that sort of volatility of stocks, equity, and so on, uh, just to make sure that your lifestyle and what your you know, month to year to even three year out horizon looks like. Yeah, yeah, the short term is far too unpredictable, right? And that's not just financial markets, that can be, you know, um, everyday life for, for the most part. Um, and so in that short term, it's not worth, in our view, it's not worth taking the risk. And the compound returns aren't there anyways. Mm -hmm. Over the next couple of years, compound returns don't really help us in the short term. They help us in the long term. That's when the exponential growth tends to happen. And so, yeah, for that reason, it's, in our view, very important that for short term dollars, things that might occur in the short term to make sure those things are set aside, more stable investments, and then allow time for those other things that have a longer time period to really benefit from that compound growth. The other topic maybe is the uh, political season, right? We've got, uh, you know, 2024 presidential election year, um, mm -hmm. you know, debt, all this, all these topics I think we're talking about now are going to come to the surface or they're going to be more in the news. You know, people are going to be talking about them, mm -hmm. politicians, uh, you know, making the case for this or that. Um, you know, do we see that as being an influence? You know, we've kind of got all time highs, we've got political year. Mm -hmm. What do we know historically? Um, I think a key item there is that markets hate uncertainty, right? And we're in a year where we're going to have uncertainty until things are sorted out more, whether it's on the political side, whether it's on the interest rate side, uh, the economic growth, inflation. We can kind of pull a lot of those factors into it and say the markets don't like the uncertainty of it, um, and they will react that way. The greater the uncertainty, um, the more potential for price swings in the market. Right, so price swings down, but also price swings up, right? Yeah. So as new information is discovered, we, we see it both ways. Yeah, and volatility too, you think about volatility of stock prices, when they start swinging uh, to the downside and the upside, right, it tends to be clustered in time, right? Meaning you get pockets of volatility where stock prices are swinging more than normal, more than average, we'll call it. And that stock, the volatility, the price swings to the downside and the upside tends to be clustered together, which tells us that um, although it's a painful time to be watching it, if you're watching on a daily basis, which we don't advocate, um, investors are investors that have held through those periods or even added or rebalanced, right, taken action in those time periods tend to, um, tend to benefit coming out of that because the volatility to the upside tends to help them after that downside period. So again, it comes back to making sure the time periods are aligned. Well, I think that's I think we've covered a, a great amount of uh, topic here and you know, got through some headlines, some insights on it. Just really glad to be doing these shows with you. Thanks for, so much. Yep. Thanks, Ezra. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies.